It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gunnar Knapp, the Director of the Institute of Social and Economic Research at the University of Alaska Anchorage. Gunnar got his PhD from Yale in 1981, came up here as a faculty member, has done economic research, fisheries research here in Alaska, worked on a variety of topics, and he'll set the stage for Alaska's fiscal facts. Please welcome Gunnar Knapp. Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Gunnar Knapp. I'm director of the Institute of Social and Economic Research, or ISER, ISER uh, down at the University of Alaska Anchorage. And um, it's, uh, it's really a pleasure and honor to be here. And it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here in Fairbanks on such a beautiful, beautiful uh, spring afternoon. I don't, I don't know why this weather is always nicer here than in Anchorage. <laughs> Doesn't seem fair. Uh, anyway, uh, I have been. Um, I've really had a fabulous opportunity throughout my career to uh, spend my entire professional career studying Alaska and uh, studying Alaska's economy and society as part of um, my job at the Institute of Social and Economic Research. And uh, part of what I've been doing uh, all this time, uh, or for a, a large part of it, is uh, teaching a course at the university about um, Alaska's economy. And as part of that course, uh, I've tried to figure out how to explain to students how our um, fiscal system works. What are our revenues? What's our spending? Um, and uh, what, what are the opportunities and challenges uh, that this has created um, for us over time? And uh, so as we have uh, found our safe self facing a new kind of fiscal challenge uh, over the past uh, six months or a uh, sort of suddenly accelerated challenge, I've tried to figure out, well, what's a, what's a way I can explain this uh, uh, to Alaskans? And so here is uh, my best shot at that. Okay, here's the chat. Okay. Oops, I guess that's not what I do. How do I make it? Oh, this way. Okay. Um, as, uh, as I think everybody knows, uh, we face in Alaska a um, significant fiscal challenge. And what I'm trying to do in this presentation is to help Alaskans understand um, the most important facts about this fiscal challenge and about the choices that we face. And I've divided the presentation in, into two parts. And the first part is uh, uh, what I consider to be some of the most just important facts you need to understand uh, just to begin to have the conversation. And part two is uh, my attempt to uh, describe what I see as the basic choices uh, that we're facing. And, and I might say that um, uh, there's a, a ton of people in this room who are very, very knowledgeable about this topic. And a lot of people might have chosen uh, slightly different facts or might have presented it in a different way, might present the choices in a different way. And, and I acknowledge this is a complicated uh, question. And uh, so I'm trying to uh, squeeze a lot into a little bit of time. So let's begin with uh, facts. And I want to talk uh, about state revenues, state spending, and our state savings. Um, now, uh, I want to start with a, a basic clarification. When you talk about Alaska's revenues, uh, the state actually receives many different kinds of revenues which we can use in, uh, in different ways. And most of this conversation about our, our fiscal challenge is about uh, what we call unrestricted general fund revenues. The, those are the revenues that pay for most of state government. And those are the revenues that we can use in any way that we wish. Um, and this year, uh, in uh, FY15, which we're coming up to the end of, we're, we have about $2.2 billion in unrestricted general fund revenues, as shown in red. Now, Alaska's state government also receives uh, a number of other kinds of revenues, uh, which are, are called rest which we call restricted revenues. And uh, we can't use those in any way that we want. Uh, how we use them is restricted either by law or by custom. Um, and we actually have uh, $7.4 billion of those kind of revenues uh, that we're spending this year, but they're, they're restricted. So for example, uh, we, uh, the st uh, state is getting $3.1 billion from the federal government, but we, we have to use that for um, specific federally funded projects like highways and so on. 
Um, and then we have um, permanent fund investment revenue or the permanent fund earnings. Uh, that has certainly uh, historically been considered restricted by custom. It's not, not money the uh, legislature normally goes to. We have charges for services like the uh, tuition that the university uh, collects or, or that the marine highway fares and so on. And then um, uh, you know, a variety of other revenues that are all restricted. But most of the conversation is about the uh, restricted, or, or sorry, unrestricted uh, general fund revenues. Okay, if we talk about those unrestricted general fund revenues, we have been extremely dependent on oil revenues to fund our state government. Um, over the period um, 2005 to 2014, oil revenues accounted for 90% of our unrestricted general fund revenues. We've been overwhelmingly dependent on oil. How am I doing? <laughs> okay. Now, <clears throat> our oil revenues are extremely sensitive to oil prices. When oil prices change, our oil revenues change. And this graph, um, which uh, is based on uh, Department of Revenue data, illustrates how um, the oil revenues that we would get in FY17, that's uh, not this next fiscal year, but the following fiscal year, how they would vary for different uh, potential oil prices, all the way from $60 a barrel up to $130 a barrel. Now, I want to point out a couple things uh, we should be aware of. Um, first of all, um, oil prices particularly make a difference at, the, at price ranges between uh, above $80, okay? When you get up to, if you go from $80 to $90 or from $90 to $100, um, a $10 per barrel change in average oil prices over the years um, changes state revenues by more than $800 million. So, uh, or, or that, what that means is, um, Every dollar change in the price of oil changes how much money we get by an, an average of um, $80 million. Okay, so prices really, really matter. Now, if you look um, at prices below $80, say in the $60 to $80 range, you'll see the revenues don't change as much as the oil price changes. And that's the bad news and that's the good news. So it's the good news in the sense that You'll recall the prices didn't go down to $80 this year. They went down to $60, $50, $40. The good news is that at, at, once they fell below $80, we weren't losing as much money as they kept falling. The bad news is a lot of us have been watching. We're going, oh, great, great. The prices are up. They're up from $40, up to $50, up to $60. But the bad news is, until they get up to about 80, we're not going to get that much extra revenue. Now, um, this graph basically tells uh, the bad news that we encountered this year. This year, oil prices fell drastically and unexpectedly. None of the so-called experts saw it coming. Um, and uh, uh, really, right at the beginning of this fiscal year, the uh, oil prices began just falling drastically, and they fell by more than half and have um, uh, since come back up uh, to the uh, low 60s uh, uh, dollars per barrel. Last, in the last legislative session, just over a year ago, when the legislature was planning, you know, making the budget for what we would spend this year, they were expecting, based on the Department of Revenue's forecast, that the state's that the price of oil would average $105 for the, for the year. But instead, we had this drastic uh, fall in prices, and, and the most recent uh, projection is that we will um, average just $67 a barrel. And you remember how sensitive our revenues are to the price, which is why this cost us a ton of money when the prices fell like that. Um, and mostly because of this fall in oil prices, our oil revenues, which in this graph are shown in red, have fallen drastically. Our oil revenues have fallen drastically. We've seen a tremendous amount of re revenue we expected to be getting. Billions and billions of dollars has just evaporated. 
We're not getting money that we had been getting and, and we're expecting to get. Um, if we go back uh, to compare our revenues this year with 2012, we've our revenues are down $7.2 billion. Well, that's an 81% drop. Now, it's not only the price of oil. There's been other factors that have played a role. Uh, um, for example, our oil production has fallen, and uh, costs, the deductible costs, uh, that uh, producers can uh, deduct from uh, their taxes and, and credits and a variety of other things have also played a role. And we could spend all evening talking about that, but the main thing is it's mostly the price of oil that has driven this and put us in this drastically lower revenue situation. Now here's a complicated graph, and um, I uh, apologize, but study hard because it'll be on the test. Um, <coughs> This graph, uh, the top line, it's a red line, and it shows the numbers I just showed you. It shows you our total state revenues. Um, and you can see that they were rising, up, uh, trending upwards, and really rising up through 2012, and then they really drastically fell, okay? And then the blue line shows what we were spending, our general fund spending. And you can see that as our revenues were rising, our spending was rising too. We were earning more money and we said, hey, we finally got a, you know, a lot more money and we started spending a lot more money. Uh, but as the revenues were rising, we didn't spend at all, we saved a lot. We saved a lot of money as, uh, as our revenues were rising from 2005 to 2012. We ran big surpluses, which are shown by those green, uh, green bars and we saved that money in savings reserves. However, beginning in 2013, we didn't cut our spending anywhere near as fast as our revenues, and so we began to run large deficits. Um, and uh, those are the deficits shown by those red bars. Uh, the deficit we are running this fiscal year, the fiscal year that's um, just a month away from ending, is absolutely huge. We're spending $6.1 billion, but we're only taking in $2.2 billion, which leaves us with a $3.9 billion deficit, or 63% of our, our spending. We're, we're not paying for out of our revenues, we're just dipping into our savings to pay for it. How big is that per Alaskan? We're spending $8,000 per Alaskan, we're only taking in $3,000 per Alaskan. So our deficit, $5,200 per Alaskan. That's the size of the problem. Well, that, this, these are the numbers for this fiscal year, the year we're in. Now, the legislature has been at work in a very difficult uh, session trying to figure out, well, how can we reduce spending? And so they've made a lot of difficult, tough decisions, and they've taken a lot of heat, and they have significantly cut Spending, you can see our total spending is down from 6.1 billion this year. The budget for next year will be about somewhere in the range of 5.3 billion. Obviously, we don't know exactly what it will be. And that, that has not been easy. But if you, um, if you look at the uh, graph, you see next year our projected revenues are still just 2.2 billion. So even with these big cuts that we've taken, we still face a huge deficit uh, next fiscal year, FY16. Now, um, if you, this is the same graph I showed you earlier, but I've extended it out uh, about um, eight more years. The Department of Revenue has uh, made projections of how our revenues are likely to change going forward. And the good news is, that they are projecting that rising oil prices are gonna to lead to higher revenues in FY17 and beyond. Um, and so again, if you're wondering where this is on the graph, look at the bottom right, it's the red line, uh, sort of the projected red line going forward. So you can see they're projecting that um, we're gonna get significantly higher revenues. But the blue line, I've drawn a straight line across, that shows suppose we continued to spend at what, um, at the budget that is, you know, probably gonna be passed for 
um, FY16, the next fiscal year, $5.3 billion. Suppose we continued to spend at that amount and take in this amount of rev uh, revenue. We would still be running, we, we, the size of the deficits would decline, but they would still be very large deficits. So if we, if we take the revenue that we, the improving revenue situation that is being forecasted and compare it with the, you know, the, even our reduced level of spending, it still leaves us with big deficits. So how have we been paying for these deficits? Well, um, remember I talked about the, how we accumulated those surpluses in savings accounts. And the two major uh, savings reserve funds uh, that the state has or had are the Constitutional Budget Reserve Fund, um, which is shown in blue at the bottom, and the Statutory Budget uh, Reserve Fund. And uh, as we accumulated those surpluses, we deposited a lot of money in these reserve funds. And now, as we've been running deficits, we are taking money out of those reserve funds uh, to, to pay for them. And so you can see that the um, Statutory Budget Reserve Fund uh, is, is going to be completely wiped out by the withdrawals from that uh, that are taking place uh, this year. And if we project ahead the level of deficits that I showed you in the previous graph, the level of deficits we would have at the projected revenues if we continue to spend at the current levels, those deficits would use up all of our savings funds by uh, FY22. In other words, if we're, we're going to start FY16 with $10.1 billion in, in these savings. And if we run, you can't run very many years of three, $3 billion deficits or even $2 billion deficits uh, on, on that level of savings. So, unfortunately, the news is tougher than that. Because the department, let's think about the Department of Revenue's uh, projections for future state revenues and, and how they're, they're projected to rise significantly. Well, what's that based on? It's, it's based on a number of complicated uh, um, things they have to take into account. But the, uh, um, the driving, the most important factor is what's going to happen to oil prices. And so their projections are based on uh, assumption that oil prices are going to rise quite sharply uh, beginning in FY17, and they're going to go up to about $110 by 2020 and up to uh, over $120 a barrel by 2024. Those are, those are the uh, underlying assumptions driving those, um, uh, those projected future revenues. But if you study the oil market, and if you read and listen to what people who sort of spend their lives immersed in oil markets are talking about, uh, you will find that many, many oil market analysts think it's highly unlikely that oil prices will actually rebound as high as the Department of Revenue's uh, projections assume. And, and a lot of analysts are predicting that prices won't rise above some number, say, in the $70 to $100 range. A lot of people are saying, we're not going to see $110 prices. We're not going to see $124 prices. We're not even going to see $100 prices. OK, this is, um, and why, why are they saying that? Well, we could spend the whole evening or the whole weekend uh, talking about this and bring in a bunch of experts. And um, they wouldn't, one, they wouldn't, wouldn't really know uh, because it's so uncertain. But the basic driving factors uh, relate to the way, you know, the, what's driving the world oil market and, and world oil prices. What drove the prices down was oversupply. World production had just, of oil had just expanded very, very rapidly and, and um, uh, it couldn't support the prices we were getting. And now the prices have fallen and what you would think would happen would be that the low-cost producers say, well, I say, I can't, I can't afford to operate at $60 a barrel, you know, so I'll shut down production and, uh, you know, wait till the prices get back, you know, can go back up to $100, $110, $120. Uh, 
But the problem with that scenario is that the more the oil analysts look at things, the world's oil producers have the capacity to bring on a tremendous amount of, bring back in a tremendous amount of expanded production at prices significantly lower than $100. For example, the lower 48 shale oil. And so if you, get, if you start getting up to a high price, all these people come back in into production or production expands more and it keeps your price from getting back up to, to where it might have been. Um, and another factor uh, that people are talking about is just world oil consumption or growth in consumption demand is, is declining for a variety of reasons. People are uh, getting into alternative energy sources, more fuel efficient cars, um, and um, there's all kinds of efforts on the horizon um, where governments are going to specifically try to get us to reduce our carbon emissions. And uh, all these things add up to, a lot of people think, lower prices going forward than we've seen in the past or than we saw um, you know, back in 2012. Now, here's the uh, uh, reality we have to live with in Alaska. We don't know what will happen to oil prices. We just don't know. We were completely surprised by what happened in the first, uh, you know, at the beginning of this year. We could be, we've been completely surprised many times in the past for good and for bad, and we will doubtless see more surprises. But I, I would suggest to you, we cannot count on oil prices miraculously rising to some new unprecedented level. And it's probably pretty unlikely. So what I want to do it now is something that is something professors get away with, and this is sort of what I inflict on my students. I'm going to show you four kind of complicated graphs to, to make one important point. So I said, well, what would happen, what are we talking about if prices don't rise as high as the Department of Revenue is predicting? And so I said, um, let's imagine seven different future oil price scenarios. And so the one is, the, the top one in red is what the Department of Revenue's uh, most recent forecast was, of the prices going up. But suppose the prices stopped rising after they got to $110, or suppose they stopped rising after they got to 100, or after they got to 90, or after they, suppose they just stopped at 60 and didn't rise at all. What would happen to our revenues if those things happened? And here is uh, what the Department of Revenue is, is saying we could uh, expect for future revenues if oil prices were at those different levels, okay? Uh, they, they analyzed, you know, using the same assumptions about the oil production and the other, other things that affect prices and said, if, if you had these alternative price scenarios, you can see the lower the price, the significantly lower amounts of revenue we, we would have in the future, okay? And uh, you also see something important, really important, you see that those lines trend downward in the future? Why do they trend downward? They trend downward because the most likely scenario for our future oil production, particularly if oil prices stay low, is that our oil production will continue the long-term decline that it's been in. So if oil prices don't rise as much as predicted, we'll have significantly lower revenues going forward. Well, what would that mean for the size of deficits we'd be facing? Well, if you take, if you take, suppose you were spending $5.3 billion and you just kept that the same and you had these different revenues, the, the red line on the bottom shows the deficits that we're looking at if, if the Department of Revenue's forecasts come true, but at lower prices, we would have significantly higher deficits going forward. You know, we can hope, we can hope the prices will be as good or better than the Department of Revenue forecast and that the deficits will be this low or lower. We can hope that, but we could be facing significantly bigger deficits if prices are lower. And finally, what would that mean for how quickly we might drain through our, our savings reserves? Um, well. Depending on the price scenario, the lower the price, 
The bigger the deficits, the quicker you run through your, your savings reserves. And so we could hope that the prices will be good, our revenues will be better, our deficits will be lower, and we'll have till 2021 or, or longer. But if prices are lower, we could, um, be, we could uh, run through our savings reserves much quicker. OK, so that's a lot about revenues. Now I want to talk a little bit about some facts about spending and savings. Um, and this is just the beginning of an introduction, and um, we're going to have some other speakers, Pat Pitney and, and others, who will talk more details about some of our spending. But here's just the basic overview. When, uh, when people divide up the state general fund budget, they divide it into three categories. The, the capital budget, the statewide operations, the capital budget shown in yellow at the top, the statewide operations budget, which is shown in the light blue, and the agency operations budget, which is shown in the dark blue. So the capital budget, what's that? That's roads and buildings and so on. And this graph shows all the way from 2005 to um, uh, projected through 2016. So that FY 2016 is sort of the estimate of where this, this year's budget is likely to end up. If you look at the capital budget, you can see that as our revenues went up, we had some pretty darn big capital budgets. Uh, we had a couple years where we had capital budget spending of close to $2 billion, right? But as our revenues have gone down, uh, we have drastically cut those capital budgets. Uh, this year, uh, you know, FY16, it's projected to be down to just a bare bones $100 million. Okay, so that capital budget went up, and now it's gone uh, way back down. Um, and then I'm going to skip ahead next to the, um, what's called the agency operations budget. That's the budget that pays for the various state agencies. Um, all, and we've got about 16 different agencies, and like the University of Alaska is an agency, the Department of Education and Early Development is an agency, Fish and Game is an agency, um, Legislature is an agency, all these different agencies, okay? So this is the budget that, that um, pays for them, and you can see that that budget went up, rose pretty considerably from 2005 to 2015, but now it's projected to be cut back pretty significantly this year, uh, next fiscal year. But if you, I want to show you another way of um, looking at that. Suppose you think, well, how much, suppose we adjust for the inflation that's occurred and the population growth that's occurred um, in terms of um, what we're spending on the agency operations per Alaskans in terms of the actual purchasing power, you can see that it didn't really rise very much. And now with the cut this year, we're pretty much back to the um, FY 2005 uh, spending level per Alaskan in terms of the purchasing power. Now, what, what is that op agency operations budget in more detail? Well, here are all the different agencies um, and uh, you can see uh, sort of what, was, what is the FY15, that's this year, what, what is the budget of all the different agencies? And two of these agencies, Education and Early Development and Health and Social Services, together account for 59% of all the agency operations budgets. And all the others account for 41%. Third place is University of Alaska, fourth, corrections, fifth, transportation, and so on. But, a huge part of the agency budget is in education and health. Now, here's the same graph, except I've tried to, I've divided it into two parts so you can see where's the growth been um, since 2005. And so the dark blue on the left is what the budget of those agencies were in, um, in uh, sorry, FY, FY06, and then the um, the, uh, the lighter part on the right is what, what's the growth that occurred. And the point I, I want to make is that growth occurred in all, all these agencies' budgets. It wasn't all just concentrated in, in one particular agency. And um, you know, the, explaining this growth in more detail is really complex. And uh, Pat Pitney, I'm sure, will tell us more about this and, and others. But um, I won't, won't take the time to do so now. One last part of the budget I want to uh, talk about is the so-called statewide operations budget. This is basically the part of the budget that's not capital spending, and it's not the agencies, it's the other things, it's money we spend that is sort of basically paying money out but not attributable to any 
particular uh, um, government function. So what does this agency operations budget consist of? Well, it has three main components. Um, one of them is debt service. We're paying about um, $200 million a year in debt service. Another uh, part that has grown rapidly in the past few years is oil tax credits, um, for which we pay out cash for certain kinds of tax credits. Um, and another um, significant portion is retirement fund contributions. Okay, now finally, um, to wrap up these facts, I want to talk a little bit about the permanent fund. So we have a permanent fund. We're blessed to have a permanent fund that is worth more than $50 billion. Now, uh, under the Constitution, we can only, we can't spend the principal of the permanent fund. Um, and that's the part shown in green. We can't spend the principal. Um, we can only spend the earnings. So this, this money is invested uh, in all kinds of uh, you know, diversified assets, and it earns money every year. And um, uh, the uh, realized earnings that it earns, uh, we are allowed to, allowed to spend. Oh, actually, I'm going to go back and say, where did that principle come from? Here's, here's where the principle came from. Every year, um, uh, a quarter of all royalties that we get from oil and certain other kinds of minerals, under the Constitution, we have to deposit those into the principle of the permanent fund. And that's one way that principle has grown over time. 35 years of depositing part of our oil royalties in. Another way is we have taken some of the earnings um, out from some of the earnings and put them into the principal as inflation proofing to keep up the purchasing power. And then at various times in the past, the legislature made quite significant uh, extra deposits or extra contributions. And those are the ways that principal has been growing uh, over time. And note, regardless of what happens to um, uh, earnings, that principal is going to continue to grow because we're going to keep on making um, uh, these royal mandated royalty deposits and uh, inflation proofing, I hope. So let's talk a little bit about the earnings. The permanent fund has been earning billions of dollars in um, uh, realized earnings or what, what is technically called statutory net income in most years. Okay, so it, it earns income every, every year, or almost every year, kind of like maybe personal investments you may have. We don't do, the permanent fund board does a great job and we earn a lot of money, but it's not the same every year and it's partly dependent on what's happening in financial markets. So it fluctuates quite a bit, but the trend has been upward over time because the principal is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, if you compare the permanent fund statutory net income, same blue line that I just showed in the previous graph, if you compare it with our oil revenues, um, this year the permanent fund earned, brought us more income than oil did. Our statutory net income from our investment earnings of the permanent fund earned more, brought us more than our oil revenues. Of course, our oil revenues were way down, and it was a pretty good year for investment earnings. But this is, if you think about it, the long-term trend is probably that direction because the permanent fund is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, has the capacity to produce bigger and bigger investment earnings, and, and unfortunately, um, the long-term trend in our, in our oil production is probably down. Um, so how have we been using those earnings? Well, we use the earnings in two main ways, and, and um, there are formulas written into uh, state statute, and one way that we're all familiar with is to pay dividends, okay? And the red line at the bottom shows um, uh, the total amount of money that we've been paying out uh, in dividends for um, you know, uh, more than three decades now. And uh, I guess uh, this past year, we paid out $1.3 billion in dividends, okay? Um, and then another significant way we've been using the earnings is inflation proofing, okay? And in the past, uh, we, we made some special deposits to principal. Now, here are the same numbers, and I've put them on the same graph as the statutory net income that I showed you before. And um, what I'm trying to show in this incredibly awkward and complicated graph is that 
in most recent years, we haven't been using all of the earnings. In other words, after we pay the dividends and after we do the inflation proofing, there's also been some earnings left over. And those are shown in that shaded uh, area at the top. Okay? And so that is the, um, I guess, retained earnings in the, in the permanent fund earnings reserve. Um, now, one last point. Uh, over on the left is a graph I showed you before about this rather bleak projection going forward about the deficits we face in the general fund. But it's um, the, on the right is a comparison of our permanent fund revenues, the statutory net income, with our spending from that uh, for dividends and inflation proofing. And you can see that the, on the permanent fund side, we're actually running a surplus and we're projected to run a surplus. So if you, if you think about our total state projected deficit, the general fund and permanent fund combined, it's less than our general fund deficit. Here's the last fact that I want to point out. Here, here's our fundamental fiscal problem, and our, it is that our oil production is falling and our population is rising. Our oil production has fallen by three quarters from what it was at its peak, uh, while our population has continued to grow. And it, it's basically going to be a challenge for us as a state to continue to do what we've done in the past, pay for most of government, based just on oil, uh, most of government with oil revenues, when you have declining production and a growing population. That's really our fundamental challenge. Okay, now I want to go on to part two of this presentation, which is considerably shorter, so I'm coming to the end. <laughs> and, and I want to just briefly outline what I see as the choices we face going forward. And I want to emphasize that I am not, I'm not advocating any of these choices. I'm not, I'm not here to preach that this is the choice we ought to make or that's the choice we ought to make. I just sort of want to outline sort of what are the actual choices we're uh, facing. Um, this is a review of the problem. And the problem is that if, if we were to continue to spend at the level that th this, this next year's budget's probably going to be about $5.3 billion, if we continued to spend at that level, and if we continued to use only our current revenue sources, mostly oil, we would face a large funding gap between what we're spending and our revenues which we have to pay for from our savings reserves. But the lower the price of the oil, the sooner we will drain our reserves and the bigger the remaining funding gap will be. And you can see that um, if we take the Department of Revenue's projected revenues, um, we'd run out of savings in 2022 and be facing a $1 billion annual deficit. But at a lower price, we would run out of revenues savings sooner, and we'd be facing bigger deficits. So which of these are we going to face? We don't know. We don't know. It could be the top row. It could be the last row. We don't know, but we need to be prepared for any of these possibilities. Or we could, we could hope you know, oil prices will rise to 200 and, and we'll have huge surpluses. We could hope that, but I'd say we need to be prepared for the possibility of something considerably less pleasant. So we face, here are the two fundamental choices. When are we going to fill this funding gap? And how are we going to fill this funding gap? So let's start with when. We have been delaying in filling the funding gap. I mean, we've, we've, made, us, we've made progress toward it. The past few years, we've been steadily cutting spending, but we still have very large deficits. And, and the longer we continue to run those deficits, well, the less the immediate pain, right? If we, if, we, if we pay for everything out of our savings, the less the immediate pain we face, and the less unnecessary pain we'll face if oil prices unexpectedly recover, and if prices go to 200, Oh, we won't have gone through all that worry. So those are some arguments for, well, let's delay. 
but there are some arguments uh, for taking action sooner. Because the longer we delay, the sooner we risk, drain, we risk just draining our reserves so we have nothing left as reserves. And if that happened, we would face drastic immediate adjustments. But other things happen if we delay. If we don't solve, the longer we take to solve this problem, the greater the risk to investor confidence about is Alaska a good place to invest in? Can they get their financial house in order? Or can we demonstrate, you know, the longer we delay, the more people begin to question that. <clears throat> Related to that is the greater the risk to our credit rating. If we're, if we're drawing down our um, savings and can't seem to get our fiscal house in order, that could potentially affect our credit rating. Also, as you draw down your savings, the lower your investment earnings from those savings. If you go from $10 billion, if $10 billion in savings, which we have now, earns you significant investment earnings, and if you spend that, then you have less investment earnings. And maybe fundamentally, if we draw these savings down, then the less we're leaving for future generations when they might need them. The other part of the question is, how will we fill the funding gap? And, and as far as I can see, basically, if we're spending more than we're taking in, or we're spending more than we have money to pay for it, well, you could say, in one way, you could say we have got two choices. Either we have to spend less or, or find, find new ways to pay for it, and then the new ways to pay for it either raise new revenues or use permanent fund earnings. None of these options are easy, and none of them are popular. And I don't like any of them, and I'm sure most of us don't like them. They're not uh, what you want to do, but these are, are only significant and practical options, some combination of those. Um, and so I just want to very briefly just touch on um, some of the things you might think about as we now go into a weekend of discussing these options, and as we go into a year or years of discussing them as Alaskans, um, just want to offer a few quick perspectives, and I'm sure that this weekend and the years ahead will offer vastly more and more insightful perspectives uh, than I can offer. But just here, here's a few things you might think about to start. So spending cuts. Well, there's really hardly anything left to cut in the capital budget, so we can't make can't really make further spending cuts out of the capital budget. Well, if we cut the statewide operations budget, we can't cut the debt service. That's a legal obligation. And cutting the retirement contributions uh, that we're obligated to um, uh, would be very difficult. Uh, probably a lot of people uh, looked at those uh, oil tax uh, credits that have been growing and, and might think, well, we could cut those. but. There, um, people uh, who look at this say that that could come at the cost uh, of, um, could significantly affect our future oil production. Um, and then, how about the agency operations cuts? Um, agency operations is the biggest part of our budget. That's where most of the cuts would have to come from, and uh, it's hard to see how we could get significant cuts without cutting our largest agencies, which are education, and early development and health and social services. How about new revenues? If you listen to Alaskans, and I, I've been trying to listen to Alaskans, I hear people talking about many, many different ways in which we could raise new revenues. And, and the Department of Revenue has produced an excellent report, which um, I think there are copies of it around here, and, uh, t and, and talks uh, uh, explores a lot of these potential revenue options and how much, how much money you might be able to get and, and other considerations. Um, and what I would suggest to you is that every single revenue option we might talk about raises questions for us. And, and here are some of the kinds of questions you might think. How much money would it generate? How long would it take for it to start generating that money? And what would it cost to implement it? Who would bear the burden and pay, actually be paying the revenues? How would it affect the economy? What are the risks of, of uh, getting revenues in these new ways? Any new revenue option is gonna take time to implement, and anything that you do to raise revenues, you really need to carefully study it and debate it, because the devil is in the details. Okay, so if we're gonna go in, 
in uh, you know, one of these directions, this is something that requires a lot of thought, which is you know, part of why, um, what we'll be talking about. Um, here are just some of the new revenue options uh, people are talking about. I'll just point out a few of the kinds of issues that they raise. This is by no means comprehensive. So um, some people are saying, well, we need to, we need to raise oil revenues. And, and this would certainly raise, um, uh, again, many of the issues that we were debating uh, last summer in, in the oil tax debate. And people might say, well, we should raise more revenues from our, um, our other resource revenues, like um, our, our, resource, um, our other resource industries, like mining and seafood and tourism. We get those industries to pay more. But I think this raises a real question of what actually is the ability of those industries to, to generate profits and, and pay more taxes, and how would it affect them? And a lot of people say, well, we need to economically diversify our state. And um, then that raises the question, well, how? What new industries, and what is the ability of these new industries actually to address you know, to contribute to our fiscal situation. Some people say we could get more revenues by um, uh, uh, investing our, our assets in new ways so that they, we can earn more money, in effect, uh, from our very significant financial assets. And a lot of ideas are being floated about ways you could do that. And of course, th that raises the question about, um, uh, well, how much could you get and, and what are the associated risks? Um, there's uh, a lot of hope uh, for uh, that we'll get earn significant new revenues from an LNG project, but um, that's still a long time away. So I'm not sure exactly how many days you have left. In your <laughs> I was in the good, but uh, we're looking. Um, and uh, there's a lot of uncertainties about how much revenue that might be. And then, of course, there's talk about income taxes and sales taxes, and those raise questions about well which Alaskans would be paying those taxes, and to what extent might um, non-resident workers or visitors contribute to them, um, and uh, with sales taxes, might, how would that affect local governments? So that's a tiny sampling of the kinds of issues we get into as we start talking about, about revenues. Um, but I want to leave you with this thought. A broad-based tax, what's that? That's a tax that most people pay. And maybe not everybody, but a large portion of the population pays. Broad-based taxes are things like sales taxes, income taxes, selective sales taxes, which are things like cigarette taxes, alcohol taxes, and, and license fees, and so on. We Alaskans pay much lower broad-based state taxes than residents of any other state. Much, much lower. Why? Because if you look at this graph, the blue shows um, how much other states raise from income taxes. Most, not all, other states have income taxes. The green line shows how much other states raise from state sales taxes. Most, not all, other states have sales taxes. In fact, most other states have both state sales taxes and income taxes. And in Alaska, we have neither, and, and we do pay um, you know, various selective um, uh, taxes, um, but uh, they're, they're still very small compared to other states. <clears throat> Finally, uh, I want to talk about this uh, option of using the permanent fund earnings. Um, the, if you look at the permanent fund corporation's projections for the future, the earnings, the dividends, and the fund value are all projected to grow in the future. Of course, it's the, you know, the investment world's uncertain, financial world's changing, but the projections are uh, for upward growth. And as I said before, we haven't been spending all the earnings, and we could use some earnings and for, to pay for government and still keep or even grow dividends. Um, I would suggest as you think about this, um, the way I look at it, there's two key questions in any any way we might use the permanent fund earnings. And, and the question one is, what's the total amount of the earnings we should use? And at the moment, we have a formula that says, well, we're going to distribute half of the average statutory net income over the previous five years. That's, what, that's the formula we use to calculate dividends, half, basically half of the average earnings. Okay. So going forward, we could say, well, we'll keep that same formula. Or we could say, well, we'll, we'll distribute more than half. Or we could go to a different formula not based on the earnings, um, such as distributing a fixed percent of market value. Then the other question is, 
if you take out a certain amount, what do you use it for? How much would go to dividends and how much to government? At the moment, 100% of, um, of the earnings we use goes to dividends. But you can think of all kinds of ideas for other ways you could do it. You could, for example, cap the dividends and use the rest for government. Or you could keep dividends the same and use the um, any increase, say maybe increase the total amount you distribute and use that for government. Now I'm not advocating any of these. I'm saying, what I'm saying is these are the kinds of questions you get into if you start talking in a practical sense about how you might use the earnings. And so finally, I would leave you, all of you, all of us, all Alaskans, with th this question, because this is basically the question we face. How would you fill our funding gap? We, part of our problem is we don't know how large that funding gap is. It might be only a billion dollars, or it might be $2.7 billion, or even higher, depending upon what happens to oil prices. So we face this question, what are we going to do? And that's what we'll be talking about. But a lot of the conversation I have heard has been about what we don't want to do. You hear a lot of people saying, I don't want to cut this, or you know, I don't want to cut this, or I don't want taxes, or I don't want to use the earnings, but the problem we have to come up, the answer we have to come up with is not what we don't want, but what we, what we can do. What are we going to do? Because this is going to be, even if we don't address it this year, we're going to have to address it within a few years because we can't go on on um, a finite amount of savings. And, and so and I think this is essentially the, uh, you know, the, the question we're, uh, discussing and, and will be discussing for, uh, for some time in the future. So in conclusion, this is how I'd summarize what I've said. Unless oil prices rise dramatically and unexpectedly, we're not going to have enough money to continue spending at the probable FY16 budget levels and keep paying for it with only our current revenues and our savings because our savings cannot sustain multi-billion dollar draws for very long. So we're gonna to have to adjust our spending or how we pay for it. And the only significant and practical options are further spending cuts, new revenues, or using permanent fund earnings. None of these options are easy, none of them are popular, and our choices are gonna affect not just ourselves, but future Alaskans. And with that, I'm done, I wish you uh, Great discussion. I myself am very much looking forward to hearing uh, and listening, just like uh, other people have talked about. Um, and uh, we at ICER, the Institute of Social and Economic Research, are, are very interested in contributing as, as we can in helping through research to understand uh, more about the uh, you know, technical details of these um, challenging and important choices we face. Thanks. Broadcast and webcast of Building a Sustainable Future, Conversations with Alaskans, is made possible by support from the State of Alaska Office of the Governor.